So we are live on Facebook podcast episode number eight, number zero. Eight. Crazy. This is wow. fun. How are man. you? Sir? I'm really good, man. Just uh, finished up a couple sessions and excited to talk about some fun topics today with you, man, and get back in the swing of things. Yeah. Yeah. With me, as always, Sean Sinisi. Olympic lifting, weightlifting extraordinaire, strength <laughs> coach, CSCS, masters in kinesiology, is it? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, we got some uh, we got some brains here to help me, the host, <laughs> this episode. Um, what we want to do today, um, obviously, being a group for basketball players, we need to train like basketball players, um, and unfortunately, the golden era of bodybuilding starring Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Frenchman Serge Nebre and Franco Colombo and all of these guys who have incredible physiques and they really helped to uh, kind of launch the fitness industry, you know, 50 years ago, 40 years ago and, and, and all these big box gyms and all of these new machines and all these things. Um, they've also uh, really kind of entrenched themselves in, ter in terms of how athletes train and uh, that's probably not the best way um, for athletes to train. So we're going to talk about that today and how do we unlearn what we've learned from the bodybuilders and, and, and how it's still affecting, you could use the word infecting, but how it's still affecting uh, athletic training. Um, Sean, I thought this was a, a, an interesting topic. Uh, I mean, what are your initial thoughts uh, when, you, when you think about it? Um, I, I'm with you. I think, I think it is kind of infecting so sports training. Um, Arnold was amazing and did so much for the fitness industry. Um, and I think we'll get into a little bit, but I mentioned to you how I talk about lenses and kind of the scope of what we see as training. Um, and Arnold brought a, a bodybuilding, um, mass culture to, to training and when someone thinks weights or thinks gym or weight room the very first thing they're going to think of is building muscle because that's the direct correlation with what we know so far in the industry and that, I mean that's kind of the the bodybuilding lens and that's kind of where training first really exploded and um, I know there's a lot of you know offshoots now but I think a lot of people especially those you know not in the sports training world or you know um not strength conditioning coaches or personal trainers, but a lot of people still think muscle when they think, Hey, I'm going to the gym. The first thing you think of is building muscle. It's like, Oh, your first question might be, Oh, are you doing chest or are you doing legs? You know? So, yeah. I mean, even, even at that nature, it's so embedded that gym means muscle. And I think it's something that we can definitely expand on. And um, there's, like I said, there's more lenses. We have, you know, sports training, we can go athletic training, we can do coordination, balance, speed, power. There's so many other things than just growing muscle. So, um, definitely a topic worth and in diving into. Yeah. So let's talk about just a uh, 30,000 foot view. You know, you're looking down from an, uh, an airplane at a city, you see the big picture, right? So big picture, what are bodybuilders trying to do? So what they're trying to do is they're trying to look better than their op opponents, than their competitors on stage. Um, they are looking to be lean. Uh, they are looking to be symmetrical. They are looking to be in most situations bigger uh, than their competitors. Um, if you think about those three things, symmetry does not help you on the basketball court. Being bigger, yeah, in some situations, Shaquille O'Neal, yeah, it could help you on the basketball court. Um, uh, and being lean, well, we know it can help you, but, but you know, in a different situation. So in basketball, what are we trying to do? Um, we're trying to beat our defenders, uh, which means quickness. We're trying to jump higher than our competitors to grab rebounds, to block shots, to, to you know, elevate and take a jump shot over them. Um, we're trying to stop them on defense, uh, whether it means jumping up to block a shot, whether it means moving your feet quickly to keep the, the, the ball handler in front of you, um, proper footwork, things like that. So all of those things are pretty opposite of what bodybuilders are trying to do. Yet, you know, basketball players go to the weight room and they're like, Oh, I got to work chest today. Or, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's arm day or it's back and biceps, chest and triceps day. So, um, yeah. the bigger thing or, or, or to take the bigger thing and to make it smaller than what I was just alluding to is those training splits. Um, that's the first thing I wanted to really dig into a little bit deeper. Um, bodybuilders 
and their training splits um, are, are used a lot in the weight rooms of athletic departments. Um, ironically, this wasn't playing. Sean's wearing his uh, Laguna Beach High School strength and conditioning shirt. He was the athletic department strength coach for a uh, Laguna Beach High School. Um, and I'm sure he had plenty of athletes, probably mostly guys, you know, we do yep. arms today, coach. Hey, we do a back and thighs today. Hey, we doing chest and tries. So yeah. bodybuilders have this training split for a couple of reasons. One, they're running steroids. They're running gear. Okay. They're, they're on steroids. Um, so they can do a lot more sets for one specific muscle group, create a lot more muscle damage, and they can recover a lot faster than you can being a natural athlete, you know, not having uh, anabolic steroids or other uh, assistance. Um, athletes, we need to work on, you know, when you play in a basketball game, are you using just your chest? No. Are you using just your back? No. Are you using just your quads? No. You're using every muscle in your body. So the training split should be a little different. Um, now, I like to split up in a perfect scenario. I'll do um, all upper body on one day, all lower body on one day. If we have less time, three days a week or two days a week, you're doing a total body workout. You will get some legs, you will get some upper body, um, but it will be a different focus. Sean, thoughts? I could not agree with you more. Um, my favorite training split, about four days a week. You know, if you're you know off season or nearing it, two uppers, two lowers. If you're three days a week or less, I'm same boat, you're three full body workouts or two full body workouts. I'm on the same page, big compound movements that look like your sport. Uh, I'm a fan of, you know, if you need to be a little bigger and put on size to like what we talk about strength ratios and, and being yeah. in structural balance, I think we'll get into that. But um, as far as training splits go, yeah, I'm movements over muscles all day long. I could share the screen with you, but that's literally the first thing. I have a, a couple bulleted items. The, the very first line item is movement over muscle. It is right there. I'm going to check that <laughs> box. Um, uh, movement precedes muscle. Now you can get muscle from movement, but movement does precede muscle. So yes, focus on the movements over muscle. Sean, so glad you did that. Um, bodybuilders, their focus is density. All right, and what do I mean by density? Um, one of the best ways to put on um, muscle or to grow, the, the term, the scientific term is hypertrophy. Um, one of the best ways for hypertrophy is density. The amount of work uh, in a short amount of time. So can we do 16 sets of chest in 75 minutes, that would be tough, but bodybuilders get it done. Um, density doesn't necessarily help an athlete in terms of their training. Why? Because we're usually doing um, a lot of um, neural, in, neural uh, dedicated exercises. We're doing whether they're uh, snatch pulls or deadlifts or um, you know any type of weightlifting movement like Sean likes to do and like, likes to coach. Those require a lot of uh, rest. And so density is out of the equation. We're not trying to pack 10 sets of five snatches into a 30 minute workout or 20 minute workout. It's, I need two for three minutes. I need four minutes per, between sets to, to do that exercise effectively as an athlete. So bodybuilders are really focused on density. Um, athletes need to focus on the neural recruitment of their muscle fibers. Um, bodybuilders also focus on symmetry. Um, obviously you need to have um, deltoids on one side, deltoid on the other side should be the same. Biceps in relation to the triceps should be symmetrical. Quads in relation to the backside should be symmetrical, things like that. Um, basketball players, if we're training correctly, you probably won't be that symmetrical. Typically basketball players have bigger shoulders Typically, basketball players have some bigger quads. There's some things that might not look on stage like you have the greatest physique, although most basketball players do have good physiques. Um, the, the, the symmetry is not our main uh, end goal uh, with bodybuilding. Um, Sean, you talked about lenses um, and, and how we see training um, and, and what we can do with weights. Um, that's not muscle. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would love to. So I mentioned a little bit earlier how, you know, when people have their first thought about when they think of the gym or they think of the weight room, the very first thing they think of is growing muscle. 
And so I see that as one lens, right? So growing muscle or like a bodybuilding uh, type of lens. So I'm looking through training as a bodybuilder. Uh, we're looking at, you know, tons of volume. We're doing a lot of uh, fatiguing sets. We're doing a lot of compound sets. We're doing a lot of, you know, muscle group training specifically. Um, and then another lens could be, you know, the strength conditioning lens. I'm looking at sports performance. I'm looking at matching movements. Uh, that happen on the field to movements in the weight room. So I'm creating a little bit of sports specificity with uh, not only the joint angles, the movement actions, but also the muscle contraction speed. Um, we could be looking at through like more of a therapeutic lens where we, we're looking at more rehab based. I can use weights for um, correcting muscle imbalances, for correcting posture imbalances, um, or any sort of dysfunction you have right to left balance. Uh, we can look at it through um, more like speed and power and other types of muscle contraction. Um, and then kind of what you said is more of a central nervous system adaptation where I'm more interested in changing the brain's ability to send signals to the muscles, to coordinate the muscles so that they work more effectively, more explosively and, and are stronger and more efficient. Um, and so at that point, we're looking at more of a central nervous system, I think was one of those points, but we're training the brain that controls the body to have a larger output um, than just the muscle itself. So different lenses being different scopes, different disciplines, um, like CrossFit can be a lens. You see training as you see training as performance. Your training is your performance. I think that's something um, I heard one time at a, um, at a conference that I really liked as opposed to training for performance. Right. Um, so like, you know, the, the um, Ninja Warrior stuff or the CrossFit stuff or things like that, where the training itself is your, your performance. CrossFit is a, a great, it's a competitive exercise. You know what I mean? So that is the performance. And so it's, that's another lens you can kind of look at, but um, it doesn't have to just be, if I'm going to the gym, I'm working on muscle, I'm growing muscle. I can be doing, you know, more strength training. I can do balance training. You can do even like agility if you get the right gym space. So um, tons of different ways we can, we can train, um, and all these things we can use weight too. So um, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, speed, power, adaptations, force qualities, whether it's strength or whether it's endurance, um, but those all require different loads. So just because I'm using a weight doesn't mean that I'm growing muscle. I could use a light weight for speed, you know, a moderate weight for power, something really heavy for strength. And those aren't muscle focused. And so lenses just being how I see training what are my goals? What am I doing in the weight room? Um, and, and what system overall am I trying to affect? Yeah, you, you touched on it. I touched on it earlier. You just hit it again, but I, I can't stress it enough that like um, the, the nervous system. <clears throat> now, let me back up a second. There are plenty of times where I have athletes and they need to put on size and we definitely <laughs> will do the rows and the bench presses and the things like that. And I think it's really important. Um, uh, especially with um, athletes who are younger in their careers, they're, you know, younger in age, 18, 19, 22, things like that. And, and they're going up against guys who are 28, 9, 30, who uh, have a little more maturity. Yes, let's put on some size, let's put on some weight. Um, but a lot of that goes back to the amount of food you eat, it goes back to the recovery, the amount of sleep that you're getting. Um, but as an athlete, we are training to compete at a high level. We are training for performance, like Sean said. So our training, while we may have some bodybuilding elements that, or you may think they're bodybuilding, um, we still are training to adapt the nervous system over the musculoskeletal system. Again, bodybuilders are getting on stage and people are judging them based on what their body looks like. No one's gonna care what your body looks like if you drop 35 on the top team in the league. <laughs> no one's gonna care what your body looks like if you're MVP of the league and you sign a huge contract next year. It's irrelevant what your body looks like. Um, we need to train to adapt the nervous system over the musculoskeletal system, and that's really key. Um, and then on top of that, you know, I mentioned I mentioned steroids earlier. Um, when you get to the especially higher levels of bodybuilding. Uh, man, they are, there's so much, uh, so many drugs that they're taking. Um, and so for that reason, it's not as healthy. Now, are there natural bodybuilders? Sure. And it's a whole big subset of the industry. But what we, another thing we want to avoid on the bodybuilding side of things is, is we want to be healthy. The healthier bodies recover faster. The healthier bodies compete better. The healthier bodies have 
uh, clear brains, which can help uh, recruit better uh, uh, nervous system and, and muscle patterns, things like that. Um, bodybuilders have most, a lot of them have really unhealthy insights. Their blood work looks bad. They, they have hormonal issues. They have erectile dysfunction. They get acne. They have all these things um, because of their lifestyle, because of the um, amount of mass that they're carrying around, amount of muscle that they're carrying around that just the human body isn't supposed to do, um, as well as the amount of drugs that they're taking. So, um, you know, from a health standpoint, it's not optimal. Um, another thing regarding the health standpoint, and again, the gym that, that, that I own, our, our slogan is healthy, mindful, strong, and healthy is first for a reason. Um, a lot of bodybuilders, they do the, the bulking and the cutting. They have their off season and their in season. And then their bulk, they, they gain a whole lot of weight and then they cut it all down. And they gain a whole lot of weight and they cut it all down. Um, that also has shown to be very unhealthy long-term. And there is, you can go on the internet and search it. There are countless stories of, uh, you know, Rich Piana recently being one of the latest ones. He was 44 years old, big, huge, massive dude, just fell over dead one day. like. Um, there are, there are a lot of unhealthy aspects of bodybuilding that as a basketball player, we just need to avoid. Now, again, they're doing a lot of good things. I'm not saying they're not, but we need to focus on the athletic side of things. We need to focus on, uh, neural recruitment on growing and developing body parts that will help our, our, our games, um, and growing and developing our nervous system to recruit as much fast twitch muscle fiber as possible so that we can run faster and jump higher. Sean, anything on that one? Uh, you nailed it. I mean, one, the biggest thing I think of is, is the training goals. What, what yeah. are your training goals? Uh, hypertrophy or muscle growth is a very common training goal, uh, especially with the population I work with being football. It's a contact sport. If you play a contact sport, you got to have, you know, muscle. If you're a big guy and you're going down to the post and you're bodying up on people, you, you're going to need some muscle. So again, to Phil's point, we're not saying don't do this. We're just saying there's other uh, more important things to focus on first, unless you have a very specified goal and your bodybuilding training is meant for you know, a specific reason. It's been charted out in the right time of your season, all that kind of stuff. But um, it's, it's mostly the fast twitch muscle fibers. You want to be moving either heavy or fast. Move light things very fast. Move heavy things as fast as they'll allow you to move them um, and, and recruit force with, with muscle contraction. And that's one thing I think the bodybuilding – doesn't allow you to do is is train all sides of muscle contraction the way they'd be used in athletics we're talking uh eccentric or slowing down the brakes we're talking isometrics that are going to um turn over the muscle from contracting length to contracting with shortness i that did not come out really well i'm a little tired guys i'm sorry <laughs> uh but the amortization phase of uh going from an eccentric or um stopping and starting again so and then also you know your concentric your explosive power stuff so those are all different um you know qualities of muscle contraction that we wouldn't be seeing with bodybuilding right if you want to elaborate on that phil please i <laughs> might need a little yeah. help. <laughs> so uh i'm going to share a couple i just want to show some videos uh these are some samples of, of some of my athletes training in the past um i don't do a lot of sumo high pulls this is one of uh, uh my basketball players he's in the group um he's in our elite training for basketball group he plays professionally um, there he is doing some, let's, let's back it up. I kind of preface it. He's doing some, some really quick, really explosive, really powerful. Um, I call these sumo high pulls. Um, still not at this point in his training, was he ready for, you know, catching cleans and snatches and things, but we definitely wanted to get some explosive work in. And then he goes right into, uh, some hurdle jumps. Okay. Real quick on the feet. Um, another one, this is only a three second video, but I, I'm using it as more of an example than anything. Another guy in the group plays uh, professionally in Lithuania. Um, this is an exercise that you would probably never see a bodybuilder do unless they're conditioning to cut weight. Um, but remember when we're playing basketball, the goal is to apply as great a force to the ground as possible and as quickly as possible. Um, I love sled pushes and sled pulls, sled drags, all those things. Um, so this is uh, Dovis here, who's you know playing one of the top teams in Lithuania, just really getting after, just driving. Looks like about 400 pounds, just as, as hard and fast as he can, training his body to 
apply as great a force as possible. And if you can imagine his body gets used to pushing weight around like this, when he doesn't have to have that, you know, limitation, that weight holding him back, getting up and down the court is a whole lot easier. And then just one more example, um, another guy who's in the group, Scott, who's playing uh, professionally in Croatia now. What? Um, if you've never tried to uh, lift a bar that is held down on the ground with bands, if Ooh. you don't move fast and if you don't move quick, that thing will pin you. You will get stuck on the ground. It will not move. You have to move with just the utmost intent, with just maximum effort. Um, so another way that I like to uh, um, train my basketball players is to just put bands on, on bars, put, put uh, chains on bars, and just really make them apply just as what? intense of an effort as they can through each rep. And one thing I'm really watching is what? I think the set Three. might have gone to four. Good. Yeah. One thing that I'm watching with this exercise is I'm watching the speed of the movements. If the speed of the movement were to slow down, I probably would have stopped his set. But I let him grind out four, and you can see the speed still there. Yep. Good. You can hear my daughter yelling in the background. Yeah. So, um, so those are just some examples of how bodybuilders probably wouldn't use those movements, but athletes really, really should use those movements. Sean, what are some movements too that, that you use or you have used at Laguna or with some of your pro football players now uh, that you just couldn't see Arnold Schwarzenegger using, you know, more modern days, Jay Cutler, some of these modern guys? Yeah, 100%. Uh, you kind of nailed it, I think, with what you said on the sled. Um, the sled pushes, pulls, drags, anything sprinting related, anything where I'm it's really, it really comes down to, to two main things. Either I'm, I'm, I'm trying to recruit motor units maximally by weight or by speed yep. um, or often as a combination of both. So yep. lifting very heavy things as fast as I can, which is slow because they're, you know, physics, but you try, it's the intent, right? Yep. Um, or doing light things maximally fast for velocity and power that way. So, I mean, for athletes, we're trying to get maximum motor unit recruitment and you can only do that with fast movements or heavy movements. Um, the muscle is only responsible for about 80% of your peak force. The, the musculature actually dies off at about 80%. And the other 20% is neural central nervous system brain capacity. So if you ever look at a chart and when you see like 80% and above, and it says, hey, this is the strength training zone because the muscle is done producing its force and it's relying on the neural output of the brain to send a bigger, faster, stronger, more coordinated signal to the muscle. So um, movements, I love, I love barbell movements, but um, mostly that's because I'm, I'm a little biased. Um, anything jumping, I'll do uh, like landmine movements, anything with a dumbbell or a medicine ball that I can throw or let go of. So I'm not having to, to stop it internally. I can just let it rip, let it fly. Um, any sort of jump or sprint or bound, anything like that when we're doing ground-based force application. Um, again, any, any sort of throw, if I have an athlete yeah. that needs to throw an implement, I mean, the weight of that and how we program that depends. But um, And then a lot of the ground-based strength power movements. I'm a big fan of squats. I'm a big fan of deadlifts. Um, you know, legs feed the wolf. Your lower body is probably the most important thing for any ground-based power sport, run, jump. Um, and the legs transfer force to the upper body. So um, overhead presses or like any of my Olympic variations, kettlebell snatches, kettlebell cleans, kettlebell swings, um, you know, landmine variations of that, like split jerks and things like that, where I'm, I'm moving a lot of parts fast and a lot of parts heavily. So big compound multi-joint movements, um, any of the Olympic lifts, any of the Olympic lifting variations. I probably use more variants of the Olympic lifts for athletes than the full lift itself. A lot of high pulls I've found in my professional career. A lot of athletes, especially um, as they get in their professional career, beat up really just to you know make it short. But they can't catch a clean because they don't have the flexibility or mobility to get the elbows up or the wrists hurt. So right. um, usually using tons of variants, explosive pulls or uh, big presses and things like that and really launching something. Yeah. And, you know, going on to the nervous system, too, um, a lot of bodybuilders might do slower movements. Um, yeah. I know with, with you know, some of my, my uh, non-athlete clients in the past, I've done, um, you know, pretend I'm doing a chest press. I might have them press for three seconds. So three, two, 
one, and then lower it down for three, two, one. So what we're doing there though, is we're hitting the type one fibers because we're moving slow in the concentric. I've never told an athlete to move slow in the concentric. Ever. Um, every time you go, like Sean said, when you get into those upper end ranges and when you're trying to go at your peak, whether it's sprinting up the court, whether it's getting up for a dunk, whatever it is, your nervous system, your brain is recruiting muscle fibers and creating a big chunk of that movement. So that's a big reason that you have to train in the weight room. If you don't take anything else, take, take this away from this talk, is that when you move in the weight room, move with as much intention as possible and as much effort as possible um, through the concentric or through the actual movement. When you squat, get up as fast as you can. When you press, press it as fast as you can. That trains your brain to recruit more motor units, which recruits more muscle fiber, more specifically the fast twitch muscle fiber. So then when you go to use those muscles in the game, jumping, running, whatever, they will be basically online, ready for your disposal. Um, we're training for the game. And so that's really what we need to do is we need to move with utmost intent. Um, you mentioned multi-planar movements and we were just chatting earlier, multi-joint movements. Um, I don't know many bodybuilders that do multi-planar movements so much. Um, I mean, have you seen that? And, and, and how important is that for an athlete? I mean, the only thing I can think of with a bodybuilder doing multi-planar is like, you know, some sort of weird deltoid rotational, like semi-rotational something for like a a posterior delt but i mean if we're athletes we need to be able to especially for basketball you guys make a thousand different change of directions a game yeah. you need to be able to turn twist bend go forward go backwards go left go right go diagonal uh turn around go sideways so when we're talking multi-planar you you see a lot of sports they're very one directional any sort of running sport or like you know track sprinting it's very we call sagittal plane dominant um but then you start adding in like, like basketball, if I got to cut laterally, lateral movement is in the frontal plane. So that's another movement plane. I got to be able to go side to side with my guy, especially on defense or what have you. And then, you know, you got the transverse plane. I need to rotate. If I want to check and pass and go over there, that direction, I need to twist my spine. I need to have good mobility through that movement. I need to have speed through that movement. If I want to pass the ball that way real quick. Yeah. I need to be able to twist and rotate. So you, not very common. You get a bodybuilder needing those movements or at least those movements at that speed to make you quick and sharp and agile. Yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, it's, it's really huge. Uh, and, and when I say multi-planar, when Sean says multi-planar, um, obviously we know, you know, that we are th three dimensional beings. There's three dimensions. There's three planes of movement. So um, a, lo a lot of movements happen in just one plane, whether you're pressing up or pressing out. So we really need to use multi-planar movements, uh, multi-joint movements. Um, now I have my athletes do bicep curls once in a while. I have them do triceps movements once in a while, but for the most part, we're using multi-joint movements. So more than one joint is working for exercise. If you think about a bicep curl, the elbow is the only joint that's moving. Um, so we, we want to use multiple joints. Because in the basketball game, obviously, you know, even a chest pass, I mean, we're using the shoulder joint, we're using the elbow joint, even the wrist is creating, you know, uh, some backspin on the ball. So multi-joint, multi-planar movements are key. Um, one other thing you mentioned, Sean, uh, that I, I wanted you to touch on was the, the fatigue and the breakdown in relation to season. Sure. Um, uh, so can you talk to that point for a minute? Yeah. Um, so when you're talking about muscle growth, hypertrophy, bodybuilding, it is the absolute most strain you can put on your body. The muscle grows as a result of being broken down and fatigued. The reason bodybuilders do so much volume is literally for they're creating immense amount of fatigue on purpose so that their muscles are, you know, weak and, and are basically forcing, you know, gene expression to grow more muscle because of how fatigued they are. It's kind of how it works. But yeah. if you do that and you're trying to practice or you're trying to play in a season, I think it's a little bit more important that we make a note of this during like, you know, preseason or during our season, because you don't want to be fatigued from a workout when you're trying to have your best performance on the court. You want to use performance to help. I'm sorry. You want to use the weight room and strength conditioning to help your performance on the court. If you just go blast a set of arms and shoulders on Friday and you got a Saturday game, you're going to be tired. You're going to be sore. You're not going to have as much force output. 
Um, you might not be, you might be feeling lethargic. You might be, you know, getting less, less sleep, might need more hydration. There's a whole other slew of things you got, your body's going to be needing. But if your goal is to grow muscle, that also means your goal is to create more fatigue and more breakdown, which is detrimental to high performance. And so when we, I think in our last podcast, we talked about in season, off season training, but an off season program where you're not playing games is where you stick the volume and where you put your growth phase, usually the further out. So that when you get closer to season, you start focusing on strength and then you start focusing on power. Then you start focusing on speed and then you maintain all the speed, strength and power you've gained. But if, if you're in the weight room and training that new muscle to move the way you want it to on the court. Yeah, yeah exactly. So you don't want to be fatigued when you're trying to play your best basketball. And if you're trying to grow muscle, you're basically fatigued. So yeah, <laughs> love it. Well, um, that's it for today. Um, a quick, a brief 32 minutes an efficient 32 minutes um Good. you know if you guys have questions on on training protocols specific to basketball versus bodybuilding or hey i'm doing uh, a chest and tricep day and i'm doing a back and biceps day and i'm doing a leg day what should i do otherwise drop a comment below please please ask uh, dm us if you dm me if you uh if, if you need if you don't want to leave a comment but um it's really important that we train as basketball players and that we train not just for, you know, and I know a lot of us have some vanity. Of course, we all want to look good. But, um, but at, at the end of the day, um, we're, trying to, we're trying to beat our opponent. We're trying to win championships. We're trying to make as much money as possible to feed our family and have a long and healthy career. Um, and that's really what our training should, should ultimately be prioritized for. Sean, any last words? Um, I usually tell people uh, to focus more on the performance side of training and, and getting their training to match what they want to be doing yeah. because lifting heavy weights, being explosive, being strong, doing all this cool stuff in the weight room. The cool thing is it also grows your muscle. Strength training also grows muscle. You're still using the muscle. It's not like it's going to get smaller and weak. Um, you know, the, the best shape people in their life are usually athletes who are doing this style of training. Yeah. The, the fast twitch, the type two muscle fibers are the ones that grow big. Your type two muscle fibers are responsible for strength, speed, and power. So they are the muscles that will grow. Um, and so just keep that in mind, lifting for strength, speed, power will also still help develop your muscles um, along with all the conditioning and the performance stuff you're doing. You're going to look just fine. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. Right Hope on. You got something out of this show. Uh, we'll see you next week. Catch ya. See ya. Bye.